Okay, good evening. We're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you for coming this evening. We have a really nice turnout, um, as we kind of were thinking was going to happen, so we're happy about that. Um, my name is Stephanie Huckestein. I'm with the Horticulture Garden, and I'd like to introduce a couple other staff that we have with the garden here. Um, in the back is the new garden director, Scott Douglas, and our Jill of all trades, Bree Wills. <laughs> she's, she's super helpful with everything, so we love having her around. Um, we are glad of this big turnout. We had a program yesterday. I realized that we have these promiscuous um, titles recently. Yesterday we had a program called Doing It in the Dark with Nighttime Pollinators, and now this Birds and the Bees thing, so kind of interesting. <laughs> I'm like, what's going on? But I'll tell you what, there was a huge turnout yesterday and today, so that's saying something. <laughs> So people like it, I guess. Um, we are, when I went to a uh, symposium in Richmond at which Dr. Jeremy Hoffman gave a talk, and I was so impressed with his presentation. It was an awesome presentation, and he had uh, such passion for climate change, and he delivered it in such an exciting, um, really wonderful presentation, and I was like, we have to bring this guy to Virginia Tech. He's really great. And so through the horticulture garden, um, climate change is certainly important to our gardeners. But then I was thinking, you know, we need to get some others on board with this. And so I contacted Phyllis um, with ICAT, and she's going to tell you a little bit about ICAT. And then also Dr. Bill Hopkins with the Global Change Center. And I knew that their audience would be interested in this important topic as well. So they were happy to be a, get on board and help sponsor uh, having Jeremy come visit us. So we're happy to have him. And I especially want to thank Dr. Bill Hopkins because and the Global Change Center because they um, sponsored sponsored financially and were able to offer this program free for everybody. So thank you so much, Bill. That's awesome. <laughs> Yay! Free is always good. Okay, so I'm going to have Bill just say a little something about the Global Change Center and Phyllis about ICAT, and then we'll introduce Jeremy. Hey, everybody. I'll keep this short and sweet because you didn't come to see uh, me talk. But, um, but basically, uh, the Global Change Center, I see lots of familiar faces. A number of you come to some of our events, oftentimes held off campus, like at the Lyric Theater and other venues like that. And we're dedicated to advancing global change research uh, and education at Virginia Tech. So we have faculty from about 25 departments around the university. We have a PhD program. Uh, and we try to sponsor events like this. We want to bring in some of the leading experts in the world to talk about these important environmental issues. So we're really excited to see everybody come out tonight. Uh, this is really important to us, and it's clearly important to basically everything we do in our community. So uh, thanks for coming, and especially uh, thank you, Dr. Hoffman, for being here. I think you're in for a, a treat. Uh, he's a, not only a, an incredible scholar, but he's a very gifted communicator, and he's also pretty funny, too, so that's, that's good. Um, <laughs> And of course, to uh, Stephanie and Phyllis uh, for involving us. So we're, we're privileged to be involved. So thanks a lot. I just want to join the chorus of thanking you for coming. Um, I work with ICAT, which is the Institute for Creativity, Arts, and Technology. Uh, we're over in the Moss Art Center. So if you don't get enough of Dr. Hoffman tonight, you can come again in the morning at 8.30 to our play date. They're um, open to the public every Friday morning. We have Carol Lee Donuts and coffee first, and then we have some mind-blowing presentation, and then there's time for questions after that. Um, so it's a lot of fun. We're in the, the learning studio. That's uh, room 253 in the Moss Art Center. We'd love to have you there. Um, ICAT works at the Nexus of Science, Engineering, Arts, and Design. So Jeremy's work is right in there, and so we're really excited to have him here on campus. So thanks for being here. Okay, thank you, Phyllis. So I'm going to have to totally read Jeremy's bio biography because he's got a lot going on here. So uh, Dr. Jeremy Hoffman graduated with distinction from Earth, in Earth Sciences from Augustana College in Rock Island, Illinois, before entering his PhD in geology with a focus in paleoclimatology at Oregon State University. Uh, Jeremy is pre previously as National Science Foundation Graduate Research Fellow, a Hamline Mitchell School of Law Science Communication Fellow, and an Oregon Museum of Science and Industry Science Communication Fellow. It's a lot of words. I was like, there's no way I'm going to remember all of that. I'm just going to have to read it. Um, 
So he is now the climate and earth scientist at the Science Museum of Virginia and focuses on urban, local, and regional climate trends and making data accessible to the public through unique data visualizations, exhibit spaces, and educational multimedia. So very cool. So Jeremy, I'm going to have you take it away. Thanks so much. All right. So I was telling everybody beforehand that um, everybody was asking me if I was comfortable using a microphone like this. And uh, actually, I have to admit something. I used to be a stand-up comedian um, before I entered my PhD program. Um, so this actually is not all that uncomfortable for me to be in front of a group of people that have not yet laughed. Um, but so <laughs> to give you a little bit of background, um, why I even got interested in climate change to begin with before we all buckle in and you see all my slides, I want to tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, so growing up, I'm from Iowa and my family used to vacation in northwestern Wisconsin and we used to go up into the north woods and eat uh, Friday night fish fries. But then my dad and I would go out basically every morning and fish uh, on these big freshwater lakes. They're actually carved by the ice sheets at, during the last ice age. They basically make these big kettle lakes and as they retreated they kind of left the depressions and then rainwater would replace them. Now they're populated with some of the most delicious fish on the entire planet. One of them is the walleye. Are there any walleye fishermen in the house? Yeah, all right, yeah. And uh, my dad used to make fried walleye and eggs for breakfast. And I have such fond memories of my dad waking me up with a freshly caught walleye. And he said, I'm gonna, uh, Jer, I'm gonna cook this up. And just, that was like, you know, childhood memories. My dad like huddled over the, the burner cooking some walleye. Well, over the years, we started to realize, started to notice on our own home lake that we weren't catching walleye anymore. Uh, and then we started to hear at the bars around town um, because my dad would bring them to bring me to those because uh, you <laughs> uh, and Tell you a little bit about how I grew up um, But at the other anglers at the other bars started to notice wow, we're not catching the same amount of walleye anymore and in 2016 a friend of mine from up there sent me a, a paper and it was while I was doing my PhD in the Wisconsin DNR the Department of Natural Resources did a report that basically investigated all the possible ways that walleye would be decreasing while bass were increasing in this lake. It turned out the only plausible explanation was that these lakes were spending so much time without ice on them throughout the year, they were basically working like a big tub of water that you put a little bit of uh, heat into over a longer period of time. It's gonna warm up more than if you were to cover it over that same amount of time. So it was basically these, wa these, these lakes were warming up more and more every year. And in fact, it had warmed up on average by about a degree, degree and a half over the course of the last 50 or 60 years. That was driving walleye to not reproduce and encouraging bass to not reproduce. So from my own life, I saw and experienced climate change happening right in front of my eyes uh, alongside my dad. And what I would say is that as a naturalist, someone that appreciates the natural world, like I would love to someday be able to take my currently non-existent son to Wisconsin to fish and eat walleye. You know, like why can't, why, why not? Because bass taste disgusting and come at me if you don't think that that's true. Um, but anyway, we're gonna talk about something. We're not gonna talk about fish. We're gonna, we're gonna depart from the aquatic world and we're gonna move into the sky um, a little bit with birds, bees, flowers, and trees. And uh, I'm gonna give you the birds and the bees talk tonight. Um, that's gonna require me to go over what exactly human-caused climate change is because for some reason, we're losing some of those details um, throughout discourse recently. Um, and then we're gonna go into how is the human caused climate change impacting phenology. And I'm going to tell you, this is not going to be an exhaustive list. In fact, these are just kind of the cream that's floated through the, through the milk that I've been tossing around in my office at the Science Museum of Virginia. This is the stuff that I've personally found to be the most exciting and interesting, compelling science, but it doesn't by any means mean that I'm giving you the whole story. So please go out and investigate this on your own. If you wanna learn more, there are hundreds of papers on this now and I'm just giving you kind of things that are relevant to the um, uh, like gardens and things that I, th I think that we all appreciate. 
And then I'm going to talk just very shortly at the end about what we're doing at the Science Museum of Virginia to communicate this and then maybe give you some tips um, on how to maybe we can all be communicating this better uh, in public um, to, to raise up uh, our fellow Americans um, and uh, figure out what we're going to do about this thing. So what exactly is human-caused climate change? I'm glad you asked. Um, I'm gonna have to take you through the best hits or the <laughs> the Hall of Fame of dead white guys really fast. Um, and in 1824, there was this French mathematician that figured out that the Earth should be actually a lot colder than it is. Um, he didn't really use the word greenhouse effect um, in any sort of way, but he did predict that that would be the case. So there's something causing heat to to be re-radiated towards the surface from the sky, keeping our planet warmer than it would be. I mean, you know, if we didn't have our atmosphere, then we'd be much like the moon with temperatures going from much below zero to much way above zero throughout the day. Then um, following work done by a woman named Eunice Foote in New York, um, who couldn't present her own research at the, the AAAS meeting that she was supposed to attend, John Tyndall kind of took her work, observational work of the heat trapping um, abilities of certain gases, including carbonic acid, which is basically CO2, um, and basically formalized the idea that, wow, these certain gases that are in our atmosphere actually retain heat and then re-radiate it. So um, John Tyndall is mostly credited as being kind of the father of the idea that CO2 is one of those things that holds on to heat and re-radiates it, even though a few years earlier a woman did it. Um, then in 1896, this strapping Svante Arrhenius um, Scandinavian fellow um, actually did the math on, wow, we're causing a lot of CO2 to be put in the atmosphere. I wonder what that's going to do to the planet because it also traps heat. Basically, he predicted that if we double CO2 in the atmosphere, so at that time, back in 1896, we were at like... 290 parts per million or something like that. If we doubled it from there, what would the effect be? He calculated about three to four degrees surface warming, three to four degrees Celsius. Now, uh, fast forward to now, we've actually warmed up about a degree Celsius and we're about a little over, well, not quite halfway there. So actually, he's not that far off. And in fact, all of the most sophisticated climate models that we have available to us tell us about that same number. So uh, a number of papers just came out in Nature over the last couple of weeks seeking to answer that same question that we answered in 1896. <clears throat> then uh, this fine uh, young man, uh, Guy Stewart Callender, in 1938, he actually was the first person to amalgamate a bunch of information about the level of CO2 in the atmosphere, how it was changing, and how global climate, global temperatures were changing. He was really the first person to go, hmm, I wonder if we can, we can actually sense this going on now. And he, was, he wrote a paper where he showed that given the certain amount of warming that we had seen versus the amount of extra carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, excuse me, that we actually can already attribute global warming to rising, excuse me, rising carbon dioxide. I had Greek food before I came here, so it's just <laughs> work with me here. Um, so there's, a, basically we've known about this thing for a long time, like a really, really long time. Almost, you know, oh, uh, almost 200 years. Um, and, you know, we've been talking about this since the 30s and then a whole bunch of stuff happened in the 60s and then one Newsweek article came out about an ice age and it was all thrown away forever. Um, but basically this is what it's gonna come down to and I know this is overtly simplistic and I'm sure all of you have seen this sort of thing before. But the greenhouse effect works very simply. The sun comes in, the planet absorbs it, has to re-radiate it as heat because it's not actually a, like a, a heat source, it's a, it's a black body and it has to re-radiate at a certain temperature and some of that CO2, some other ones, methane and, and, and uh, N2O, vibrate at a certain frequency. They absorb that photon and then re-radiate it as heat, causing there to be this kind of natural balance. You still have to have heat escaping into space, but some of it's retained at the, at the, at the lower parts of the atmosphere. That's like, basically, that's just what happens, and that's what Fourier talked about back in the 1800s. 
But what we are doing to it is this. More greenhouse gases means that for the same amount of solar radiation, we're actually holding more heat back at the surface and less is escaping the heat to, into space. We can see this from space. It's not something that we can't see happening. We can actually see less heat escaping into space. So we're way up in space and we have satellites that are like, wow, less heat is escaping. And we're like, yeah, that's what we predicted back in the 1800s. But that's what's happening. The greenhouse effect intensified by humans, that's the difference. There's a natural one and then there's the one that's happening now. And if we're gonna simplify it even more, and, I, and I, I, I debate myself whether I'm gonna show this or not, but realistically, like a kid's cartoon tells you everything you need to know about global warming and global climate change, is that the more CO2 we put into the atmosphere, it's like putting more blankets on. And that, you know, uh, other than ignoring physics, um, that really is a pretty good explanation for what's happening. Um, so, well, you might ask yourself, how do we know that CO2 is even going up? <laughs> how do we know that? And I think this is a really fun scientific story. This is La Jolla, California, and at the Scripps Institute of Oceanography. If you ever go there, it's a beautiful place, very picturesque, classic surfer town. You can't afford a house there, you know, great burritos, that kind of thing. Um, and what <laughs> every single morning that there's a wind coming in from the ocean, um, this guy who's the son of, um, who's the son of Ralph, this is Ralph Keeling, and his dad, David Keeling, started doing this back in the 60s. And they walk out on La Jolla Pier, and they have to open the, the, the gauge on this little balloon and walk into the wind, holding their breath, and then close the nozzle. And then they take it back into their lab and they analyze it for the amount of CO2 that's in it. They've been doing that marginally every day uh, since 1958. And when you start to look at what that looks like, this is you know father-son working together. It's a really beautiful scientific story. Um, but this is, uh, now this is at Mauna Loa Obser Observatory, but this is still the same technique that they use at Scripps. And they use the La Jolla location as a check on this. And basically, when they started, we were down at around 310 parts per million. Now it goes up at a pretty you know, steady pace. We're well over 400 parts per million now. And uh, on January 20th, um, we were reaching 408 parts per million. And what you can see is this kind of jagged shape to the curve uh, happening every single season, actually. That's the earth breathing in and out. Um, it's really fascinating as plants grow and decay in the northern hemisphere because most of the land is there. They actually respirate the earth. So this is the earth breathing, but then something's going on underneath it, and that turns out to be, excuse us, uh, us uh, burning fossil fuels. Um, so that's what that looks like. But then a good question would be like, how do we know that that's weird, right? So always with science, we have to ask, how weird is this? Um, well, fortunately for us, some really smart people about 30 years ago discovered that little bubbles uh, of trapped air in columns of ice in the cold regions of our planet in Greenland and Antarctic and Antarctica trap ancient atmosphere. So as the snow falls, it accumulates like pancakes of ice. And as it freezes, it takes a little while for it to freeze in. So it's smoothing about like, you know, it's, it's smoothing year to year. Um, but overall, it's trapping yearly pancakes of ice full of air that at that location. Turns out that Antarctica seems to be a very good approximation for the entire globe. So now we've gone to a bunch of different places in Antarctica and they all look the same. So we're like, huh, well, um, well, how does that look next to the record that Ralph put together? Well, there's where the um, CO2 record at Mauna Loa starts. Here's where we are. And then here's the Mauna Loa or the ice core data at Do uh, Law Dome in Antarctica going back to the like early 1700s. So there's the Declaration of Independence signing. 
And here's where we are now. So over that time period, you know, we like to think of the Industrial Revolution starting about 1750, American Revolution starting at 1776, the better revolution in my opinion, um, that slowly in, we've been increasing the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere and there's quite good overlap between the observational data set and then that which has been locked away in an environmental archive of that data, okay? So again, here we go. It's never been above 400 parts per million in the last couple hundred years. Another good question, how weird is that? I'm glad you asked. We can go even further. Here's the last 10,000 years. This is a time period called the Holocene, um, right at the end of the Ice Ages, which is called the Quaternary Period. Um, and what we can see is through most of the time period that humans have even been doing our agricultural thing, which is kind of what defines us, um, it's never been above about 250, 270. And actually now you can, I know a lot of you are picking up on, there about, there's starting to be this rise in CO2 uh, starting about 6,000 years ago. In fact, this has been something that only recently a professor at the University of Virginia has amalgamated enough information to confirm that this is an early imprint of human agriculture on the uh, CO2 concentration of our atmosphere. So humans have had, a, a started having an effect on our planet much before uh, uh, 1750, and we're not still shorting, sorting out exactly what the impact of that was, but looking at the last 10,000 years, even if you were to cut it at the slow rise of human agriculture versus the precipitous rise of uh, human industry, here's where we are now, and here's where we, we've been used to it as a species. Now, another good question is, again, how weird is that? <laughs> I'm glad you asked. Here's 800,000 years of global CO2 levels. Now this is the heartbeat of the planet. If we were talking about the, heart, the, the planet breathing, this cycle here is the cycle of the ice ages. And these are the heartbeats of the planet. This is when ice sheets were really small. This is when ice sheets are really big. And you can see there are natural climate changes. You know that thing that people toss around about natural cycles and climate? This is what they're talking about. And paleoclimatologists have known about this for a long time. And we were the ones that discovered it. So um, here you go. Uh, the Earth has never really gone above 270 parts per million or 290, a little bit of time here, um, that we haven't had 400 parts per million in the atmosphere for at least a million years. And it's turning out more and more that it's, we're pushing that number back into the tens of millions of years, rapidly approaching, you know, multiple tens of millions of years. So the amount of, atm of, of atmospheric CO2 is well off the uh, usual chart. Um, and we can owe our understanding of that to our wonderful paleoclimatologists under seeking to understand how uh, ice accumulates in the thick part of Antarctica. So, um, oh, just to give you context, here's where we showed up on the scene. Um, so we've while we've experienced higher sea level or CO2 in, um, and lower CO2, we've never been in a world like this before. So human activities have profoundly altered the natural heat tripping ability of our atmosphere. And in order to show you that, here's a wonderful graph from our folks at NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, very worthy of our support. Um, 20, 2017 was the third warmest year on record. Uh, it didn't have a push from El Nino like 2016. And uh, um, this green line really shows you kind of the longer term trend. And then here's the year to year variation of um, con the United States, contiguous United States average, temperature, average temperatures on the rise. You might say, what does Virginia look like? Glad you asked. Here's Virginia. Um, you know, we've got a little bit of waves and stuff in the early part of the 1900s. Then about 1950, we've been on an upward climb. Uh, and really, you can focus on this interannual variability, but I think it's really important to see the kind of longer term trend. We haven't seen this turn back around yet, um, but it fits in with our understanding of how global climate change or global warming and then global climate change occurs. Now, you might say, well, what about Blacksburg? Well, we're in climate division six in Virginia, and that kind of looks exactly like what is happening across the state of Virginia. Um, but anyway, we're, we're warming up. Um, and uh, the last like decade has been the warmest decade pretty much on record um, in Virginia and across all of our climate divisions. So uh, if you want to know how I got these data, we can talk about that. Please email me. I'll show you my email at the end. But I don't want to spend too much time talking about little graphs like that. You came to hear about bees. 
So this has resulted in planetary warming and changes to several observable Earth systems. So it's really hard for us to observe, like any one of us, to observe global temperature, right? All we can really observe is the discomfort or comfort that we're feeling at that time, um, especially in the South where our summers feel so warm. But here are the kind of indicators of a warming world that we can point to. So a warming up planet results in all of these different things, from glaciers retreating to snow cover reducing to actually the amount of water in the atmosphere increasing. It's about 7% more water vapor in the air for every one degree Celsius. How much have we warmed up? About a degree Celsius. How much has the water vapor content gone up in the atmosphere? 7%, exactly. And that's, a, that's actually a law that uh, I didn't even talk about. It's a completely different mathematical constraint on the um, water content of air. But um, so we see air temperatures going up, the sea surface temperature of the oceans going up, attendantly the sea levels going up, our ice sheets are getting smaller. But what we're here to learn about tonight are these wonderful little creatures going on. Species migrating upward and poleward and spring coming earlier. That then has an impact on all of our favorite charismatic plants and flowers and all of that. We could come back to all this, come to some of my other talks, come to the museum. Happy to tell you all you want to know about all these other things, but tonight we're going to focus more on that. So how is human-caused climate change impacting birds, bees, flower trees, and other things? Glad you asked. So the biggest thing is that we saw that this shifts in the season length. So um, uh, the biggest, the big paper that I like to show about this is our friend Mike Allen at the um, uh, Old Dominion University in Norfolk on the other side of the state. And it, using records from major weather stations from 1948 to 1912 all over the country, he basically queried it like, well, how have the seasons been changing at all of these different places? And what makes this study unique is that it, he defined the seasons based on the climate. So you know, like the seasons here aren't the same as the seasons up in Boston and certainly the seasons here aren't the same as what you feel out in LA so you know defining a place by its own climate is really important when you want to see the long-term trends so that's exactly what he did and this is what came out of it these are the different seasons autumn winter summer and spring and then the circles show you Basically, the dark circles are the ones that had a statistically significant trend, but they all had nearly positive trends. Um, and in autumn, meaning that the, uh, that the, um, Autumn is setting later into the, into the fall. So like the first frost, for example, is happening later into October. Um, that would be the kind of thing to bring out of that. But then on the other side of the, the, the calendar, the springtime, which a lot of our East Coast cities are seeing statistically significant trends, uh, that spring is actually occurring earlier. Uh, moving backwards in time. So it really, all this is happening at the expense of our winter. So it's like we're losing that time period where we are feeling cold. Now, we just went through a bunch of freezing time, times around here. So it's hard to remember that for like the last decade, we've had way above average winters. So we have this kind of, you know, I mean, like we all like to remember the things that just happened, but it is important with climate to remember that kind of longer term trend. And this is what that longer term tra turn trend looks like. So we've got a spring that's happening uh, earlier and an autumn that's happening later. So we're, the summer is like oozing out into the fall and spring, okay? Um, now, what does that mean for as far as like actual phenology or the timing of life events in uh, plants and animals? Well, we've been tracking the arrival of the first, uh, first fr frost in the fall, first frost in the fall, and the last frost in the spring um, and for a long time. And well, over the last, you know, couple decades, that has been kind of precipitously changing. And with that uh, deviation, me meaning that the uh, fall frost is happening much later than usual, the long term average is here, and then the spring is happening much, much earlier. Uh, and that is lengthening our growing season. So that's at the nas national level, that's the entire contiguous 48 states. But a good question would be, what does that look like, like year to year? This was last year, so 2017. Anybody remember how freakishly warm that was. February, actually, the study came out that attributed these warm Februaries that we've been having the last several years to being increasingly common and warmer due to climate change. So these sorts of early springs, though the colors here are three weeks early. Anywhere that's colored red had spring three weeks early. 
Now, that was just last year. This year, we we're starting off to a bit sluggish, a more sluggish start, but this is the kind of spring that if we continue to have those warmer Februaries, we might be experiencing this on a more year-to-year -year basis. Now, um, what does that look like on the long term? Remember, we want to ask, well, how weird is this? Well, here's the National Park Service is wonderful. And one of the reasons that they're wonderful, on top of being great educators and stewards of our land, they actually have been measuring the arrival of first leaf and first bloom, not FBI like the other FBI. <laughs> You can't escape them. Um, but the, the, they've been tracking the arrival of these phenological events since the, like, since the beginning of the uh, 1900s. And so at 75% of our national parks, we are seeing earlier springs in the, in the, by measured, measured by the arrival of these first leaves and first blooms. So that is showing, in, I mean, even up in, in Alaska. So it's and all through here. So this is where we're at right now. The first bloom index has been showing much outside of natural variability uh, over the last 100 years. Uh, what does that look like at the kind of local level? This is the cherry blossom trees in Washington, DC. And we're looking at the date of their peak bloom on this scale and the year. So in 1920 and 1919, Helen Taft uh, undertook the first public project undertaken by a first lady in the history of the um, United States and planted a bunch of cherry blossom trees, or sakura, uh, donated by the mayor, or the, yeah, I think it's the mayor of Tokyo. And the Viscountess Iwachinda um, came and actually helped Helen Taft plant them. And then starting in 1920, the National Park Service started taking stock of when they were reaching their full bloom. And though it's kind of hard to see, uh, the, the statistics on this show a increase, or a, a, an earlier um, date of the peak bloom by about five days over that time period. So what else are we looking at? That's that purple line. That pink area is the Cherry Blossom Festival. Look how messed up that's been. By not knowing when our peak bloom is going to happen and assuming that it's going to happen at the same time it has always, year, uh, uh, always has in the Farmer's Almanac, we might actually miss a chance to have an economic impact on our communities. So if, think of not just the Cherry Blossom Festival, but think of like the rhododendron festival or you know the lilac festival where i grew up like if we don't know when people are when we can expect this we can't plan for the things that supercharge our our local economies now what does this look like i'm going to tell you the most fascinating story because you're going to i hope you're all saying well how weird is this because in Japan, and we're going to look at this in the, in, the, in, the, in the opposite direction. So down is earlier, okay? I fl they had to flip because scientists are weird. But the, w this down is earlier on this one, okay? Monks in, or monks, I want to say something better than that because I think there's a cultural reference that I'm missing there. But in Kyoto, Japan, they have been, st they've been exercising this, uh, uh, this practice called hanami. And I'm sorry if there are any Japanese speakers in here because I'm certainly not a native speaker. Um, but hanami is the seasonal exploration of the impermanence of life by studying the blossom of cherry blossoms in Kyoto and writing about it. They write absolutely beautiful poetry about these cherry blossoms that you might just Google it when you get home. But what the researchers from Japan did is they reconstructed the m annual mean date of that, of that full bloom as indicated in these notes from people long, long ago. And what you can see is that there are times, sure, there are these natural cycles of times when it's a little bit later than usual and a little bit earlier than usual. But once you get to about the mid-1800s, it has absolutely collapsed towards being earlier and earlier. Now, sure, there are some people here that are like, well, Kyoto was also a bunch of you know, small grass buildings and wood buildings back here and very spread apart, and now it's a metropolis. And I'm not arguing with that. But the springtime temperature of the average springtime temperature in Kyoto uh, correlates perfectly with the time of the, their peak bloom. So by saying that it could be something else, yes, of course, there's always alternative hypotheses. And scientists look through those to see if those are possible. The key thing that's explaining this is increasing springtime average temperatures in Kyoto. And that's one of the things that we're also seeing here in DC. So these are the same trees, <laughs> you know, they're, they're cousins of each other. And look at the story, the absolute magnificent scientific story that they're telling us. 
in Richmond, a much less pretty graph, <laughs> I will admit, our trees are also doing something really interesting. I digitized a 30, well, I didn't, uh, with the help of a very dedicated undergraduate research assistant, uh, we digitized a 30 year, <laughs> there's some graduate students in here that are like, yes, or undergrads? Yeah, okay, yeah, I was once there too. And it felt really kind of good to be like, here is your project. Um, but okay, so, so, the, so the project was, Someone had been taking counts, uh, this woman named Becky Colley, absolute fantastic woman. She's known colloquially in Richmond as the pollen lady. And um, she's been collecting pollen samples on the roof of her allergist building for 30 years um, since, uh, since the late 1980s or the early 1980s, and, or early, 19, early 1988. And anyway, the date of the peak tree pollen, which is predominantly cedar, that has been, oops, I ruined it. I had a punchline. The, uh, the tree pollen date, the peak tree pollen date has been progressively moving earlier and earlier over the course of that entire record. Um, now we have some other data in there. Not only is the peak tree pollen date changing, so the actual earlier in the season, we are having the worst tree pollen day, but the concentration is going up as well. So it's getting more uncomfortable earlier in the year in Richmond. This is 2017, it was right on schedule, <laughs> basically, as far as the regression line goes. Um, and we're writing this up. We have an allergist writing a paper with us. It's very cool. Um, so what does that do to us? Of course, um, the key allergen in Richmond air is tree pollen. It is cedar. That's when most people go to the hospital for seasonal allergies. We have a collaborator at the Virginia Department of Health that's helping us with that as well. So what does this mean for us? We start our seasonal allergy <laughs> medications earlier. We're spending more money on seasonal allergy medications um, on top of missing our local tree bloom festival with pies and stuff. So we're going there and we're sneezing earlier in the year. Um, but it's not just happening here, it's happening all over the world. Now this looks like a complete mess and I understand. But just the, the, the idea here is that the phenological change of different organisms. Now this is all plants, trees, things like that, and their growing season, the amount of time it takes for them to reach peak tree season or bloom or anything like that, it's 21 different variables that went into this analysis. And the phenological change as, uh, as described by their standard deviations, so like the amount of difference from usual, as uh, it would be a good way to think about this, is that they're all positive, all over the world in some places are seeing things that are way outside of normal. So this is using satellites from space. So it's not just things happening locally, it's not just here in this country, it's happening everywhere. Uh, and I wanna drive that home that it's really, the climate is changing and it's affecting our plants. Um, so okay, we can cross off trees and flowers. What about the birds? Well. I'm glad you asked. Again, time on, the, time on the bottom here, moving from older to newer. And then the average distance moved north in like the center bird abundance. So birds are moving north and en masse. Like they're all like, uh, kind of tiptoeing backwards from the south is like what you, my, I kind of like to picture it. And so they've moved about 40 miles north uh, in all of the birds that the Audubon Society has been tracking since the 60s. Now, if we break this down into individual types of birds, this is where it gets really fascinating. Land birds in the dark circles in the, in the lines, and then the water birds in the X's. Why would water birds be moving further north, or I guess uh, inland, uh, and northwards than the land birds themselves. So the scientists that were part of this National Audubon Society report they basically posited that because the water birds usually are used to like oceanically regulated climate that goes like this, and the land typically goes like this, now the land, and <laughs> the land is seeing less of those extremes. Remember how we said that we're losing winter? 
So now the land is looking more like that oceanic kind of like not as much big temperature changes. So the water birds are actually moving further inland because they can actually survive longer and for more part of the year uh, inland than they used to. So by splitting that into those two, you get this other really interesting story. I hope I didn't butcher that Audubon Society. But we can actually then predict into the future. So we have these wonderful computers that can tell us what the climate it might be like in the future, depending on what we decide to do collectively and at an international level. But uh, we're looking at two, four different time slices of my favorite bird in the entire world, the aquatic common loon. These things are insane. If you've never seen one before, go home and look it up on YouTube. They have the coolest call in the entire world, and they swim and they are they mate for life there was these two they're like on that lake that i used to go to with my dad there was a, a nesting couple that was there and we saw them raise many different uh, uh hatches of of birds whatever you want to call their their <laughs> groups of young um but basically the blue is where they mostly hang out during the winter and the yellow is where they hang out in the fall or in the in the summer and here's where that lake was in wisconsin I might, not only will I not be able to cook walleye for my kids, but we won't be able to try and imitate the loon calls. That's really, that's really sad to me. And in fact, we'll have to go there in the winter, which might end up looking a lot more like the fall or the spring. Now, the something that's a little bit more locally relevant. <laughs> yes, I got laughs. I really, I really, I, re I know it's not a turkey, cause, but it's confusing, okay? Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's like the Hawkeye in Iowa. It's like, what is that really? Um, but, you know, if we're going to think of, you know, the hokey bird as a turkey, which, I mean, they look kind of spitting image to me, um, that <laughs> if who here hunts, I, I, I've never really been much of a hunter, but all right, not really many people. But um, if you like hunting, you know, this is something that you like to do. You can pretty much do nearly year round in Virginia. Um, but by the end of the century, we might be actually losing the opportunity here in Southwest Virginia to go and see the bird that inspired, may or may not have inspired, our lovely um, uh, uh, mascot here uh, at VT. Now, something that um, people like to go out, bird, any birders? A couple birders? Yeah, I'm learning how to be a birder right now, and it is awesome. Purple finch. One of the most beautiful little tiny birds that nobody thinks about because it's not huge, it's not a turkey, it's not a loon. It's just a regular old bird, but beautiful nonetheless. It might completely disappear from our viewing area here in Virginia by the end of the century and populate where Canada is. Labrador will be its new vacation spot. Um, so that's just some of the things that... Uh, the Audubon Society has been able to do. Go check out their website. Audubon Society has all these resources. You can actually click on individual birds. That is not by far the, the, the totality of what they've done as far as different birds. Go find your favorite bird and see where it might, you might have to go see it uh, by the middle part of the century. Now, bees. Um, okay, we got a little bit of time. Um, the bees. This has been something that really does have a bunch of different competing impacts, okay? So um, bees, a lot of the times what you hear on the news are pesticides or you hear land use changes or you hear, um, you know, who knows, um, you know, alkaline water. But the, uh, the thing that I'm going to show you here is that actually um, the, this, this climate change impact is the predominant one. Um, and this came out in 2015. And if this line is straight, it means that the bees aren't moving anywhere. Okay, so these are 423,000 georeferenced observations of different types of bees. Okay, all over the world. If this line is straight, it means that they're not moving any direction north or south. So what this side of the graph means is that they're not moving farther north. Okay, so this is they're staying in the same place on the northern limits of where they are seen. But they are moving very fast away from their southern limits. It's a vice. The authors kind of suggest that it could be that there's sunlight missing from those higher northern latitudes, so they're not moving north because they're not getting light. There could be temperatures that are different, not enough food, all those sorts of things. But pretty much like the only thing that we can think of is that it's getting too warm too far south um, and 
uh, that's something that is you know causing they're basically getting squeezed uh, at their northern limit by the retreat from their southern limit um, so uh, that actually in 2017 this was just last March we put the bumblebee on the endangered species list. Um, we might not have an endangered species list for very long, so maybe it'll be off of it again. But the bee's population of this specific bee, Bombus affinis, the rusty patch bumblebee, probably the coolest looking, but it's the one that looks like a, like a Huey helicopter flying through the air. It's like a mouse with wings. Um, it, that was put on the endangered species list. Um, and uh, in Germany, uh, on the other side of the Atlantic, these are observa the yellow bars are observations made in 1989 of the amount of insects, the mass of insects in this one region in Germany, a nature reserve. Uh, and that's in 1989. And in 2013, that's what it looks like. So there are some things. Now, this is very much unsettled what is actually going on here. Um, but, you know, it's pretty much kind of not out of the realm of possibility that we are missing by looking at some of these other things we're missing uh, some stuff that's happening right under our eyes and this is what actually the person refers to um, as the windshield phenomenon and over time we've just had less and less bugs on our windshields and what does that mean and what's driving that and this is science again that's continuing and w until we have all the facts and all the, the ways that these things interact, it's hard to come to one conclusion on this, but it is a disturbing observation nonetheless. So I took you on, <laughs> like I said, my kind of like favorite things to talk about because a lot of the times I can relate them back to me, <laughs> but I want to talk a little bit about how we're doing this at Science Museum of Virginia, it gives me a little bit of a chance to talk about some fun stuff that we've done. We held a press conference um, for a bee. Go and look this up. Uh, it's on YouTube. Um, uh, just go to the Science Museum of Virginia's YouTube page and you'll see all of the antics that we've gotten up to. But the bee, basically, it's like a breaking news about the bee being put on the endangered species list. Um, this is actually being used in some classrooms in Virginia. It's aligned with some of our standards of learning. If there are any teachers in the audience, um, we also have a bee colony uh, on, uh, in one of our lab spaces so people can get an intimate look on the way that these sorts of bees work together. But uh, I would say that the bumblebees are solitary. These are culinary. So they are different, but at least we can have a chance to talk to them about what's going on in bee world. Um, and we have people, and we have one great thing about the Science Museum of Virginia is that we get visitors from K to gray. Um, you know, and I think that's a really unique way to interact and you get families to talk about these things together and learn about something like the ecosystem that relates bees back to humans. Now we have a, a, a Boy Scout uh, named Jack who's building a bee hotel. These are four solitary bees. Um, so he's building a bee hotel for us to put on the, uh, on the grounds. You can do this by just having some logs placed about in your gardens with holes drilled in them. You don't need a big elaborate hotel, but you can create a house for a wayward solitary bee um, very simply. And uh, uh, you, know, you can just drill holes into untreated wood, preferably Virginia native. Um, but this is one way that you can take a personal action you know, pretty much tomorrow um, to help save some bees. Uh, we also planted a pollinator garden with money from Dominion Energy. This is the backyard of the Science Museum. Please come and see us. We've got a, excuse me, it's a demonstration garden. All local plants. We're going to start a citizen science project measuring the, uh, basically the phenological, phenological happenings. In the back garden, we're going to measure the number of different types of pollinators that we have, hopefully setting up a long-term observation system. Maybe if you do the same thing here, we could compare data. That would be fun. Um, so <laughs> uh, we also got a, uh, a 3D printed, check this thing out. I love this thing. 3D printed solar powered weather station. And it is legit. And it costs not 20,000, not 10,000, not even $1,000. It's $300 for all this equipment. And uh, the 3D print plans are available through the National Center for Atmospheric Research. Uh, all it takes is a little bit of time to hook it into their system, and then you've got real-time, minute-by-minute data. Could be a really cool thing to think about for a place like the Global Change Center at Virginia Tech. Um, 
if you don't already have a, a, a weather station, I'm sure you do. But anyway, um, it's really it's really neat. So we'll be able to look at, that's right next to the garden too. So we'll be able to time test whether like what plants are sensitive to temperature, what's sensitive to, temp to precipitation. Now that's gonna take a while to unfold. So, um, you know, don't ask me about this right now. Maybe in five years, we'll have some, some observations that are really um, captivating. We're also getting certified through the local phenology leadership program. If you want to do something like lead phenological observation networks in the southwestern Virginia area, Nature's Notebook is the is the online class to go through. I'm currently going through it right now, um, and it gives you an opportunity to build an activity around your favorite local flora and or fauna. So, uh, and then that, that data gets fed back into this. So we actually get um, some real useful data out of it. Then there's the Cornell Lab of Ornithology uh, for future things. I'm gonna speed up a little bit because I still wanna talk to all of you. Um, but uh, there are some local scale trends that we can start looking at. So I showed you some climate divisional data earlier. That's available through the um, uh, State of the Climate or through uh, NOAA's website in there, just look up U.S. Climate Divisions, and you are in Virginia 6, uh, if you want to look into some, some long-term data trends here. You can calculate things like the number of mosquito survivability days, and maybe that's something that we can all agree sucks. Um, <laughs> that that number is going up, not cool. Um, then we can also uh, definitely, we need to talk about what might happen next. The largest uncertainty in those bird things that I showed you and anything about the future climate is what we all decide to do right now. Literally, that is the largest uncertainty. There's like no, I mean, th that it dominates what we don't know about the future is how we behave. So talk to people about that. I think that for people to concentrate on things like, oh, the models don't do anything. Yes, they do. They've been fantastic for many, many decades. The largest uncertainty is our collective action. Um, you can look at something like the NOAA Climate Resilience Toolkit. You can go to, I think it's called Toolkit. Um, do you just look up NOAA's Resilience Toolkit? It's a great resource to start having those conversations with people in your communities. Um, and then think about how to frame this for certain audiences. If you're an environmentalist, but you want to go talk to a group of hunters, uh, or you're, uh, you just need to know your audience. So uh, connect over a shared value before you start talking about these things about like carbon taxes and things like that. Don't go for the throat right away, you know? Um, so this is the Resilience Toolkit. This is some of the things that you can get. Um, here's Richmond City. These are days above 95 degrees. This is the kind of uncertainty that I'm talking about. Here's lower emissions where we just kind of decrease the amount of CO2 we're putting in the atmosphere, whereas red is drill, baby, drill. And you can see that that is the largest difference between those different uh, uh, possible futures for the city. Then also things like a, a garden can put up different sorts of things about what the, the future might look like and what you might need to do around here to adapt. Um, so uh, yeah, so anyway, but the biggest thing is I don't think that we should ignore it anymore. Absolutely not ignore it anymore. Um, there's always different regional climate uh, centers or local climate scientists or meteorologists that you can talk to or just email me. Uh, there's my email um, and Thank you so much for your attention. This has been officially your bird and the bees talk. Uh, thank again. Thank you to um, to ICAT and the Global Change Center and the Han Agricultural Garden uh, Horticultural Garden for bringing me here. And thank you all for your attention so much. Ask me some questions. I think it's that a combination of that ice core data. So really that to see that ice core and how that naturally happened versus where we are now, I think that's a very compelling way to show it. But granted, that's coming from my, my own perspective. So like I said, knowing the audience that you're speaking to might inform you to what they would value the most to, to, to kind of zero in on the way that you can attach it to humans. Um, but there, I mean, 
uh, the fact that we know so much about paleo climate, that is really the, the nail in the coffin for a lot of the arguments that you have with people about these natural cycles. Because yes, paleoclimatologists discovered those natural cycles and those aren't happening anymore. So, or they are, but they're being dominated by the human influence. So um, if you know who you're gonna talk to, you can tailor that message in a way that connects with them over a shared value. I hope that helps. Yes, sir. Sure. Yeah. And, um, it's becoming right. So, so if, if that isn't enough, um, I think that remarking on the, uh, the, the alarming rapidity of what's happening is really what it's like, yes, maybe there were times in the earth's past when it was warmer than now. Of course it was. That's what we, we there's no argument about that. It's just that that took many hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years to occur. Whereas this is happening in a hundred years. So it's about emphasizing that difference in rate. Once it becomes, well, I'm just gonna keep pushing the yardstick back or the finish line back, then you have to start pulling out things about the rate at which it is changing is so alarmingly different from what we've ever seen in any sort of time period before. Even things, yeah, it's, I mean, I could, I mean, being a paleoclimatologist, I can think about times when it's been rapid, but not at all close to what's happening now by an order, a couple orders of magnitude. So it's rate. I hope that helps. Tell me how that goes. I, I too, have varied success. Y yeah, yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, sir. Totally. And that's a really good point is that a lot of these things, some, some animals are going gangbusters. So there are some things that are able to adapt very rapidly. Uh, one of them being all of us sitting in this room. So, you know, there are things that will be just fine, but then that's those kind of cascading impacts of a mismatch in the timing between a bee and a flower or a bee in your tomato plant. Um, you know, those are the sorts of things that we need to be thinking about. And you're absolutely right. Some things will be able to adapt pretty rapidly. That's, that's evolution, you know, but um, yeah, sometimes, but do we want that? And we are causing that. So <laughs> I think, thank you for your comment. Yeah, in the back. I'm so sad I have to go back to Richmond. Yeah. I'm gonna, I need to get your email. Uh, Nice. Um, yeah, sure. Go ahead. That would be vandalism. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. Point taken uh, quite, quite well. Um, so, so one thing that I would really recommend is joining up together and maybe something as simple. Do you already compost here? Do you do? Oh, well, geez, you're way ahead of all the Richmond campuses. Um, so, uh, you know, it's about now, maybe the thing to, to think about would be where are those holes in sustainability um, that still exist? that you can normalize the behavior. So I think maybe the key thing is your class, what do you see as the thing that's still wasteful? Are people still buying single-use plastic bottles of water? Yeah, a lot of people do that. 
how do we change that? How do we normalize to not do that anymore? How do you know? And without changing, without making it uncomfortable, because otherwise people are going to reject it. So I think really the, the key thing for the younger generations to think about is like, how do we make this our own thing? I mean, Tide Pods, you know what I mean? So why is it Tide Pods and not <laughs> reusable bottles? Not saying that you eat Tide Pods, but what I'm, <laughs> but basically you need to normalize. <laughs> We need to normalize the behavior that is sustainable and will and think about that with your group of friends. What do you not like about what you see? And then go out and attack it. Yeah. And as, as, a, as a not super recent, but kind of recent college student, you know, it was getting involved that helped me develop these sorts of things that I find to be very valuable in my life now. So I would echo that, absolutely. ICAT, the Han Agri Horticultural Center and the Global Change, Global Change Center. Yeah, I think, how much time do we have? Can we still go? If people need to leave, I'm sure. Okay, okay. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks very much. So, uh, yeah. What can we? What's up? I have interned with NASA as GPS at their GIS Temp project, and I was there the summer that they published the How to Tune on Mercury and How to July on Mercury. And as an intern, I feel like I was a little bright edge. A lot of the scientists that I was working with were very disheartened, and when asked kind of what we're gonna do about this, they sometimes had stated that irreversible effects of climate change, loss of property, loss of life, and things like this are already and already happening. So what do you think um, are our chances of curbing this, and also um, how irreversible is it? So the question uh, here was this student um, had an awesome internship with GIST Temp, which is a, uh, a product of the NASA Goddard Climate Center up in Maryland. Um, and were you working with Gavin Schmidt or just on that kind of black team? That's so cool. Yeah, very cool. I'm, I'm envious of that internship opportunity. Um, the question was how much of what is happening is baked into the system? So even if we were to cha change the trajectory of, of heat trapping gas emissions, how much of it is, is, is still going to happen? And, and w what do I feel about that, I guess? <laughs> or do, what do I think of as the chances that we're going to turn it around? Have we passed the point of no return? It depends on what, it, so this, this is a very good question and I helped work on a project in my PhD on this very question and we've been wondering this too in the climate science community is we take these climate models that have accurately hind casted the last 100 years and then we are going ahead 100 years and we see where that goes and then we just leave the edge of the graph and we don't think about, well what about a thousand years from now? Turns out that pretty much, you know, regardless of a lot of different pathways of heat trapping gases, sea level will continue to rise for a very long time. So that vulnerability I don't think is going to go away. Um, ice sheets don't respond to weather, they re-equilibrate to the climate. So um, that is the thing where they are catching up. So the sea level that we're seeing go up right now is, you know, stuff, it's playing catch up. So I, to be honest, that is the thing that I am personally the most invested in trying to figure out. Thankfully, the state of Virginia has a bunch of really cool projects going on right now in Norfolk. Um, the human um, urban housing and urban development grant is like $180 million spent to build resilience to that sea level rise. 
But as far as like other things, um, that's to me, that is the one that's going to be a generational issue. Everything else will, can turn back around pretty rapidly. Um, and we can, we can do that. It just takes a lot of effort to get, you know, renewables. We need to decarbonize. That's like the number one thing, but then we can all be taking steps to make ourselves, you know, safer, our communities more resilient now, um, to avoid those disturbances in the future. So I thank you for your question, but yeah, sea level is pretty much like, we're fairly certain that that's going to continue to go up even, even with, um, mitigation of carbon emissions. So yes. No, it is. <laughs> a lot, yeah. So there's a there's a there's a program in the Department of Civil Engineering working on an anaerobic digester um, to reduce food waste. I don't like this. I d uh, so you would talk to Dr. Stephen Cox. In the civil engineering department. Stephen Cox. C O X. C O X. Do we? <laughs> did we? Did we leave anything? Did we leave any laundry unfolded? Then let us one well, last. Let's top it off and then let's go eat this daily bread thing that everybody's been like, ooh. <laughs> Yeah, perfect, perfect example, Shenandoah salamander. Um, it is, the, it depends on a certain amount of moisture, not getting that at the lower elevations anymore. And the competing salamander is moving north or moving up in elevation. So there's a local example of really charismatic, funny looking salamander that you probably won't see unless you get on the very top peaks of the Shenandoah Mountains. It's endemic to the Shenandoah Mountains. Uh, the Shenandoah salamander is one that's happening right now in Virginia, losing its habitat upwards a mountain. So yes, that is happening indeed. Thank you for bringing that up. I didn't share anything about salamanders. That's for next time. Thank you so much. Let's go eat.